Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 513th New Social Environment. Um, I'm Carolyn, the Programs Associate here at the Rail, um, and I'm excited to be your MC today for a conversation featuring Torquase Dyson, Matthew Sims, Alex Bacon, and Phyllis Tuckman on the event of two current exhibitions of works by Terrell and Reinhardt at Pace Gallery. Um, and we're thrill thrilled to welcome poet Mark Wallace here to close today's program. Um, before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for our working document of resources and actions. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, um, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Uh, your contribution will directly support our writers, guests, artists, um, production staff, and operations here at The Rail. Please check the chat in a moment for more information and links to donate. Um, and now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Um, Torquase Dyson describes herself as a painter working across multiple mediums to explore the continuity between ecology, infrastructure, and architecture. Examining environmental racism, as well as the history and future of Black spatial liberation strategies, Dyson's abstract works grapple with the ways in which space is perceived and negotiated particularly by black and brown bodies. In 2019, Dyson's solo exhibition, I Can Drink the Distance, was on view at the, Co the Cooper Union um, and her work was also presented at the Sharjah Biennial. Matthew Sims is professor of art history in the School of Art at California State University, Long Beach. He's also um, Gerald N. Bente Buck, West Coast Collector, Archives of American Art, Smithsonian Institution. Um, we have Alex Bacon is an art historian based in New York City and co-editor with Hal Foster of a collection of essays on Richard Hamilton from MIT Press, as well as the author of texts in various exhibition catalogs and edited volumes. In 2013, he co-edited with Barbara Rose the Rails Centennial Special Issue dedicated to Ed Reinhardt in 2013. He is currently completing his PhD in art history at Princeton with a dissertation on the first decade of Frank Stella's career. And Phyllis Tuckman is a critic and art historian. She has taught at Williams College, Hunter College, and the School of Visual Arts. She's currently writing a book on the life and times of Robert Smithson. She's an editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail. Um, thank you all for being here. And I'm gonna turn it over to you, Alex. Thank you, Carolyn, uh, for that introduction. And I guess, are we going to get the PowerPoint up? And so I'm gonna start us with Ad Reinhardt, uh, the exhibition which was curated by James Terrell, which I think is a very special opportunity uh, for us to see the work of another artist through one artist's eyes and I'm also looking forward to discussing, so I think that's one sort of topic we can discuss what it means for one artist to sort of engage with their predecessors and to present their work um, and what it means for an artist to be a curator uh, as opposed to let's say an art historian or a, another form of arts professional. And I'm also interested to discuss the topic which is one that I've myself been researching and have written on uh, including my contribution to the book and rail special issue of um, on Ad Reinhardt uh, that I co-edited back in 2013, uh, which is the question of Reinhardt's own approach to installation. So I think quickly we can go through some uh, images and I really encourage people to go to the show, obviously, especially because um, this is a show that you really kind of need to see it to sort of understand 
the subtlety and complexity, both of the paintings by Ad Reinhardt and also the way that Terrell presents them for us. So um, here you can see already the sort of key elements of Terrell's installation, which are um, this sort of infrastructure of display. And you can see that what he has done is he, so he selected three bodies of work by Ad Reinhardt dating from the early 50s uh, through to the 1960s. And so these are the red paintings, the blue paintings and the black paintings. And we can understand these as the sort of apogee, uh, so to speak, of Reinhardt's production. And I'm sure most people here are familiar with Ad Reinhardt as an artist, but obviously he was a member of uh, the New York School, uh, born in 1913. And so he's of the same generation as Jackson Pollock, de Kooning, um, Barnett Newman, Mark Rothko. And so he, in that sort of grouping, is obviously on the sort of more minimal, abstract, um, geometric side, and was always very proud that he was the only artist by his own description that was always abstract. Though, of course, and perhaps we'll discuss this, um, he also produced um, cartoon illustrations, but always, and was also a prolific writer, but saw those as very separate um, forms of activity. And so for him, you know, painting was obviously a very rigorous and focused and self-referential practice. And so, um, you know, this, his work evolved over several decades, starting in the 1930s. And so what we're seeing is really the culmination, I would say, of a sort of careers length artistic research. And, and not every artist obviously functions this way, but Reinhardt was an artist who worked almost teleologically. You know, one set of paintings would lead to the next. And the idea in his own mind was that he was sort of improving always upon the previous work until he reached the black paintings. And so by the early 1960s, he understood that the five foot square black painting with a single vertical and horizontal division was the sort of, you know, in his description, the last painting that he could paint. And we can discuss this, uh, this idea because for me, he's not meaning of course that this is the end of painting as a practice, but rather I think he saw this as the final stage of a certain history of Western painting um, extending from the Renaissance. And so for in his mind, he had isolated color and form and brought it to its sort of final statement with the hope, I think, and I think this leads us into Terrell, that the next generation of artists, which he was very interested in, what they were going to do was go beyond what he could do. And here you see a great example from the exhibition of one of these classic 60 by 60 inch square paintings. And so his idea was that, you know, him being of a certain generation, he was closing out a conversation around painting and setting the stage for a new uh, group of artists. And so he was actually very interested in the work of let's say minimalist artists like Donald Judd or Dan Flavin. And famously he curated for Dwan Gallery um, an exhibition called 10 which included <clears throat> many of these minimalist artists and which he worked with Robert Morris, who he was quite friendly with and Robert Smithson to organize that exhibition uh, at Dwan Gallery. And so there was a lot of openness, even though Reinhardt's own language around painting was quite, um, you know, can be seen as very dogmatic and restrictive. He was very interested in what other artists might do sort of to lead out of that. And so I think in a sense, he set the stage very much for an artist like Terrell to both interpret these ideas of form and color within let's say a non-painterly uh, medium, this sort of installation medium. And also um, he was very interested, as I mentioned in uh, techniques of installation. And so maybe we can actually skip uh, to the uh, images of, of Reinhardt's that I provided, Carolyn, of the, so here you get a kind of quick survey. Okay, so here, so this is actually a letter 
that Ad Reinhardt sent to Dorothy Miller, who was a curator at MoMA. And so in 1963, um, Dorothy Miller included Reinhardt in this Americans 1963. And this was a, a large survey exhibition of contemporary art practices of the time. And so what's interesting and what I wanna sort of preface this larger conversation today is that, um, you know, what Terrell has done with his installation is not necessarily a brand new idea of how to present this work of Reinhardt's or let alone other artists. And I think we're lucky to have Matthew Sim Sims here today, for example, who's written about uh, Robert Irwin and other sort of West Coast light and space artists, including, you know, which of course includes Terrell. And he can speak uh, more about this question of, uh, of installation, uh, which sort of emerged in this moment. And so, but I wanna trace us back to Reinhardt. So Reinhardt, uh, in 1963, what he notices is that when he installs, so this is the first time that he installs um, this ultimate expression of his painting, the 60 inch square black paintings. And so he installs seven of them in the gallery at MoMA. And what he sees already, which is what this letter is about at the opening is that people uh, are touching the paintings. They're very susceptible to damage. And so he comes up with this idea of stanchions and this idea that the paintings have to be protected, but also that the work, and if you read the letter, you can see that uh, he likes the idea of separating the paintings. So if you see these pillars in the drawing, these are not, um, you know, these are not part of the architecture of MoMA. These are ideas that he wanted to separate the paintings. And you can see that in the second paragraph. So this idea, which we see Terrell implementing, which is when you see the show at Pace, each painting is separated from the other paintings by those kind of wall sections. So when you go in, you sort of see one painting at a time. And this, my point here is that this is something that Reinhardt already was interested in by 1963. And in fact, as he mentions in the letter, actually already in 1961, when his work was included at the Guggenheim, he liked that those bays at the Guggenheim separated the paintings, which he references here. So then if we go to the next slide, please. Uh, so this is a, um, a publication from Art Forum that Reinhardt did. And what you see here are two installation images. The top one is the Duong Gallery in Los Angeles from 1963 and the bottom one is Betty Parsons in 1965. And so here again, what we see is this evolution of another element that Terrell includes in his installation, which is the platform. So on the top image, the Duan Gallery show, which we know that Terrell saw this show in Los Angeles. And um, in fact, Matthew wrote for the Brooklyn Rail special issue about, um, Reinhardt's visit to LA where he gave a famous lecture and we can talk about that. But anyway, in what uh, Reinhardt really liked about uh, the, the architecture of the Duan Gallery in Los Angeles is what you see there. Those are actually sort of marble insets in the floor of the gallery. And the gallery was actually a former um, store. So it had this sort of parquet floor with the marble edge and so it created these sort of platforms. And this was just a sort of incident of the architecture, but Reinhardt, just the same way that when he saw the Guggenheim installation, which he wasn't involved in, he really liked that isolation of the painting. So that's something that he saw and then wanted to incorporate in his own work, his own installations. And then when he saw that floor at uh, Duan, he also wanted to incorporate that platform idea. So that's why you see a few years later when he shows at Betty Parsons, he actually has them build these platforms. And so this is also the evolution of the stanchion that he in instituted for that show at MoMA. And I think the idea was that the stanchion was maybe a bit too invasive and a bit too maybe, I don't know, old fashioned as a sort of, you know, design. And so he liked this idea of the platform, and maybe we could say this is a reference to the sort of rising aesthetics of minimalism uh, at the time, which of course he was very involved in, as I mentioned. And so 
Then the third element uh, that I think relates to the Terrell installation is that, um, so when he showed at Betty Parsons, this was actually a three-part exhibition at the time in 1965, where Reinhardt did one show of black paintings, one show of red paintings, and one show of blue paintings. So we see that this is the same group of works that Terrell has chosen, and it's also the same group of work that Reinhardt chose to express his idea of what his painting meant for a public. So when he had this opportunity in 65 to do that show, or rather multiple shows, because in fact, there were three venues. And so the paintings were shown in groups of just that group at three different galleries, Betty Parsons, Stable Gallery, and Graham Gallery. And so what's interesting is that Terrell, his installation is actually extremely sensitive to Reinhardt's own ideas about how his painting should be seen, down to the sort of gray coloration of the wall. This was an idea that Reinhardt was playing with at the end of his life, that maybe in fact the white wall was not the ideal wall, but something on the gray scale because it doesn't, you know, the white wall reflects light and potentially competes. And also the sort of last element, which maybe then connects to Terrell's own work, but is this idea of lighting. And so in Terrell's installation of the Reinhardt's, what you can see is that the, first of all, the lighting is very low and also the lighting is dispersed. Maybe we can actually go back to one of those installation images, uh, Carolyn, of the show. Um, it's maybe hard, yeah, maybe we'll leave on this one. Uh, maybe it's hard to tell, but basically if you go into the show and you look at the lighting system, you can see that it's very carefully using spotlights, but that the spotlights are not directly on the surface of the painting. And this is actually, and I don't necessarily know that uh, Terrell would have known all this, but um, in the research I've done, there are letters, Reinhardt also really liked this idea of lighting as being diffuse and dispersed. He didn't want to light up the surface in a focused way. He wanted to diffuse light evenly. And so the idea, of course, what is the point of all this staging? And you see that in the pace installation, there's even, it goes to the point where there are curtains to block out the light so that the light is very controlled within the gallery. And I think this is also sensitive to Reinhardt. You can see in that letter, he draws a curtain uh, across the doorway of uh, the MoMA gallery. And so um, these are all ideas that Reinhardt had. And basically what I found really interesting um, in reviewing that material was that, you know, we have a lot of this sort of discussion about the emergence of minimalism, the emergence of, you know, uh, monochrome painting as, you know, leading into the sort of spatial politics of minimalist objects by artists like Donald Judd or Robert Morris. But in fact, this is something that Reinhardt also realized was important to painting, that when you reduce the content of the painting so drastically that it's very easy to then miss things in the painting and that it's easy to just walk by it and say, oh, it's just a black square. Uh, even though in the case of Reinhardt, none of his paintings are single colors. They're all made up of multiple colors. And that includes the black paintings. They're actually mixtures of green, uh, red, and blue. Um, but anyway, basically the idea was that he wanted to focus the viewer's attention on the canvas. So all this sort of apparatus, um, and I think we can put the bench in there as something that I think Reinhardt also would have liked, which Terrell has included, is these benches for viewing. And um, it's all designed to sort of tell the viewer look into the canvas and spend time with them. Because of course, with Reinhardt, they're very much not empty. They are, when you look at them, there's this subtly unfolding play where form starts to emerge and then, you know, submerge, color starts to emerge and then go away. There's something that the longer you spend with them, the more you see. And I think the final thing I'll say, because I think it also relates to Terrell, is that what, um, is essentially created by Reinhardt within the canvas is a sort of color story, a color narrative. So that unfolding uh, happens through the vehicle of color, including with the black paintings. 
So as you look longer at the paintings, again, those colors, those blues, reds, sort of emerge as a sort of heat that kind of emanates out from underneath that blackness that we initially uh, encounter. So there's a sort of uh, dispersion that happens over time where they become more complex. Now, what's interesting, if we could move to one of the red or blue paintings, and so these paintings start slightly before the black paintings, but then there's a period in the early to mid 50s when Reinhardt is making all three canvases simultaneously. And in fact, the only reason he stops painting red and blue is because he thinks they're too easy to misunderstand because people associate things with those colors and they create preferences. Whereas for him, black is a neutral color. And so it perhaps allows more of what he wants people to see. But that's why I think he wanted to show the blue and the red and black together in 1965 is because for him, they function the same way. And so what that means actually though, is that the red and the blue function almost in the opposite narrative arc as the black paintings. So instead of color emerging, what you have with the red and blue is actually over time, things start to submerge. So you might start to see divisions of form, but over time they sort of become a single panel of color and there's a kind of interesting reversal. So I think, and maybe this is a point on which I can turn the conversation over to uh, Phyllis who will guide us through the Terrell, but I think Terrell was especially drawn to Reinhardt. And this is something that he mentioned when I interviewed him also for the Brooklyn Rail in 2013, was that idea that these are color experiences which shift over time. And of course that shifting of color experience over time is also what characterizes Terrell's work. So with that, I think I'll turn the stage, uh, so to speak, over to Phyllis. Oh, I thought, uh, I thought we were gonna talk about, about Reinhardt first among us. Oh, okay. Yeah. Let's, let's do that then. Um, do you, Phyllis, do you have any immediate uh, comments? Well, to... My first reaction when you talked about Reinhardt uh, being solely an abstract artist, but then the comics and whatever, and then of course those wonderful um, slides that Zwerner showed, is Amy Silman uh, the kind of artist that, that Reinhardt would expect um, coming out of his work because of Amy's being an abstract art artist, the comics and, and uh, you know, the figures are kind of masked in her work. I mean, what, what is abstraction for Reinhardt? Is it simply a geometric abstraction or just abstraction? Well, I think that for Reinhardt, I mean, obviously abstraction is another one of these terms <clears throat> that we sort of use as if we know what it means, but I mean, it's very easy to break it down quickly because, you know, of course the origin of abstraction is abstraction from something, right? It's a, a figure that maybe then turns into squares. And of course that is exactly not what Reinhardt is about. He's not interested in any reference point. This is, and I guess this gets to a bit what he is trying to accomplish, which is, for him, that sort of purity of geometry, like why does Reinhardt turn to geometry? And I think it speaks also to his position art historically as being of a certain generation, sort of emerging in the time of, you know, uh, neoplasticism and also that expression within US artists like Burgoyne Diller and Ilya <clears throat> Boltowski, you know, those are the artists that he would have encountered as the sort of leading American quote unquote abstract painters of you know, his generation, the generation prior that he would have sort of entered that art scene. And so I think geometry you know, was a sort of narrative that he was interested in, but I think that what happened over time, and I think this is why he then became a reference point for artists like Terrell, is that that interest in geometry shifted into more of an interest in perception and how perception could be activated. And I think this is why, even though he had a sort of period where he worked more gesturally, sort of obviously, and this is something that was in the air, you know, by the mid 
to late 1940s in New York. And so there's, of course, that period of, of, uh, uh, of gesture within uh, uh, Reinhardt's work. But then why does he return to um, geometry? I think it's because he sees that geometry, and especially as he sort of starts to tune the colors and, they, and make them closer in value so that there's a less distinction between one and another, that more happens in the eye. And so I think he was very interested in, and actually there he had a lot of interest in op art, for example, uh, when it first emerged, I think he became disaffected with it over time, but he even collaborated with Bridget Riley at a point, um, they did a publication together uh, that he did the writing and she did the um, sort of illustrations. And so he actually had a lot of interest in what younger artists were doing and not just minimal artists, but I think this is the thing that really links all of it is this interest in perception. And so the vehicle that Reinhardt saw for that was geometry, even though over time that geometry became more subtle, the divisions, you know, harder to discern, but it was nonetheless the vehicle. And I think, you know, in a certain sense, a certain form of geometry is present in, in Terrell, you could argue as well. Can I say something about that in relationship to um, Amy Selman? I think that's a really interesting, um, I think that these, these two artists are really interesting to think, you know, beside each other. And, if, and what I'm really interested in experiencing, uh, Reinhardt's work, sorry, Reinhardt's work in real time and through uh, a lens of art history is this idea of refusing um, a kind of politic of both visual culture, a kind of, and what I mean is visual culture as propaganda, visual culture as um, something violent, visual culture as something that is, um, dominates our consciousness. And I think that Amy in the same way has this level um, of refusal to take painting um, as a form that simply sort of propagates, I think, what we um, sort of experience in the day to day and ask us to make um, preference, um, the power of refusal towards a kind of, you know, our own subjective consciousness and our own objective experiences to things that may be far away, right? So I think if this makes any sense, I think to think about those two artists together as people who are painters who really refuse a kind of um, popular culture, popular ideas of images, popular politic, um, you know, propaganda around the world we live in. Um, I think that's the way I enter those two artists as I think of them together. Um, just the, how can painting um, by choosing a kind of approach to um, abstraction can act as, you know, deep refusals. Um, I, I think that that's important. Wow. Can I chime in too? I, uh, I, I'm very uh, struck with what you just said, Torquoise. There's, there's a kind of um, refusal of extraction. There's a kind of anti-extractive quality to Reinhardt that, he, and, he, and he talks about, you know, um, sort of requiring the viewer to, to, to slow down, to take time and to, there's, at first there's not gonna be something there. And there's a kind of opacity then to the work that requires that one set aside certain kind of uh, habits of visual culture. That's, that's, a really, um, that's a really fascinating point. And I don't, I don't know if you uh, would have any interest in talking about the relationship between those kinds of ideas and your own work, I'd be really interested to hear that. Well, I, um, sure, I, that, uh, yes, I think about um, refusal in relationship um, to Reinhardt and his blue paintings. Well, right now I'm actually writing a lot about Reinhardt, so I'm gonna make a specific point um, that I think about Reinhardt's blue paintings and I think about um, the writer Dion Brand in her book, The Blue Clerk. So there's a level, I think, of Reinhardt in his own writing that suggests within the history of painting, um, there's a sort of um, 
you know, problem. <laughs> you know, there's a problem the way in which um, uh, painting has continuous, continuously existed in this very sort of linear form that really um, rejects any kind of deep participation from the viewer. And when I enter uh, Reinhardt's work specifically, I think, especially when I was a younger artist, I knew I was here to participate in something, that my brain, my mind, my optical capacity um, was asked to show up and witness. And I think that that kind of consciousness that brings you into the present moment of hereness and nowness, I think is really a, a kind of radical moment for me in relationship to the Blue Clerk, Dion Brand's book, where the Blue Clerk, is, Blue Clerk is a character within this book, an energy and within this book, that just like these blue paintings, I think refuse a kind of narrative around economy, popular culture, ideas of even race. And I think that when um, the, the few times that uh, Reinhardt even talks about race, he rejects the idea of the uh, idea of, of a fixity. Right. Um, so when he talks about the black paintings and he, when he arrives there as a painter, um, I'm really interested in how he gets to um, a point of his own making. And this is, I think, you know, you can't explain this through any way but rigor in the studio to really create a disappearance, a removal of all of the noise, um, you know, in the in our culture and remove them not just to think, be, think about geometric abstraction, the optical experience, but the removal of them is the refusal of them. So within um, Dan Brandt's work in the Blue Clerk and the, the Blue Paintings, um, and to the further extent the Black Paintings, um, this opacity um, is not quite, I think, opacity. I think it's the invitation to participate and let the eye and brain and you know, do its work over time. Um, and so in that way, you know, witnessing and a kind of stillness in the way stillness happens, you know, um, within matter and light happiness happens over time, I think our bodies become accounted for. Um, so, you know, that I think I want to I want to sort of talk about that in relationship to refusal and opacities and in the ways in which we develop um you know, to enter this work and participate um, with our full bodies um, when we enter. I don't know if that answers your question, but I don't know if I've arrived. I don't know if I've arrived at, I always say to myself, where is my blue clerk and where are my blue paintings? You know, I'm not quite there yet, but I know that um, that's not something that you can get to without you know, a real excavation of your own consciousness and refusal to um, participate in the foolishness of the world that we live in uh, without rejecting it, right? He's put, asking us to participate. He's not saying reject it. He's saying, let's push against it. Um, so it's not something that he's sort of moving out the way um, to do something else. He's pushing through it. Um, so, and I answer like that just because I'm in the middle of trying to figure out you know, what these blue paintings and these black paintings are doing to me after I've read the blue clerk a couple of times, right? So, um, yeah. Well, I think that's very interesting because in a way it shows how these forms that we might term refusal and what people might identify as quote unquote, the difficulty of the paintings is also this, uh, giving of agency to the viewer like the shift to the black painting is on one hand seems like a reduction and yet on the other hand that invitation to looking which you discussed so nicely is an invitation that gives us agency it's not saying here's the image you know digest it which i think is maybe the kind of mode that we're discussing is what's being refused this sort of idea that you know the sort of image as you know, propaganda or, you know, advertisement or whatever is sort of trying to deliver us a meaning and, and have us digest it and sort of telling us that meaning. And, and these are paintings where these acts that seem, you know, to make them more obscure, more difficult are actually ways in which 
they're allowing us in if we can take the time. And I think that's, I mean, it's one of the major dilemmas, I guess, of sort of more minimal art in general, which is that as it becomes in a certain sense more simple and on one level more accessible because it's more direct. And so the visual activity is very direct in Reinhardt. It might be complex and it might take time, but it is not, it doesn't require, you know, art education. It doesn't require a PhD. It's open to everyone and anyone who is willing to take that time. And yet, of course, time is that thing which we don't necessarily know to take or how to take. I mean, that is the sort of crucial ingredient, which I think a lot of artists, uh, you know, for at least, I guess we could say the history of, you know, quote unquote abstraction have been trying to solve is like, what is that uh, negotiation between trying to reach a mass audience? And that's the sort of irony is that these paintings by quote unquote abstract artists are often seen as being for a small audience, being about art. And yet many of those artists actually turn towards modes of abstraction as a means to open the work to a larger audience. And so it's this interesting dynamic uh, that, you know, this agency is sort of given or offered, and yet it is not uh, a foregone conclusion that people will take it, you know? And so it shows that agency is not something that can just be delivered you know, like a commodity, it's something that someone has to, uh, you know, engage with. And I think that's also maybe part of what uh, the evolution of an artist like Reinhardt's uh, paintings is about, is trying to understand how to allow that involvement of the viewer, that what you so lovely described as a sort of full body engagement, how does a painting allow for that to happen? And this is not a simple question. I also think that, you know, um, as I've sort of see the show and understand how Terrell has curated it, I'm convinced that some people just aren't healthy enough to look at a painting. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just not convinced that we're in a society where we're healthy enough um, to really put ourselves in the condition to look at painting. And um, so there's one, in one way, I think that these works are you know, contemporary in that they're completely discursive. I think that the ways in which we can experience in, there, there's his intention, there's Reinhardt's intention, and then there's what they do in real time. Um, and then that's where we are, you know, in 2022 in a condition of madness, you know? And I think that the work in real time, this work rejects that kind of um, both insistence on madness, but madness as, a, especially in American, as a foregone conclusion. Um, so I am really interested in um, these work as not only didactic works, but discursive works and how they move, um, you know, over time. And I'm, I'm interested in my own health as a human being, being able to experience um, you know, the black paintings after I experienced the blue paintings, you know, am I, am I prepared, right? Am I prepared to sit through his work? Am I prepared to sit through Terrell's, you know? Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a rigor on our part also. So I don't, I don't assume that everyone can, you know, um, you know, absorb these things, you know, I think the world would probably a bit better place if we all could. And I think that that's a destination as a human being to be able to witness um, a, the Blue Clark, the Terrells, you know, the, the Reinhardts. Um, not to say that those other things, uh, especially around the history of figuration and three-dimensional space and the painting and all those things aren't absolutely necessary. Um, but I think what he was doing was urgent then and it's urgent now. I'm I'm speechless at what you're saying. It's just you're you're kind of returning the paintings to uh, their original moment, and it's just astonishing. What I I think I think what you're saying is very true. Well, especially because of course the 1950s and 60s were also a time that must have felt apocalyptic. For people living through it, you know, with the Vietnam War and race riots. And I mean, you know, we, we think of this art that's very minimal and reduced and formal, but of course the backdrop to a lot of this art, and I think, I think the urge, there must have been a sort of urgency. And we know that 
Reinhardt was very political and he was very engaged with all these issues on the ground and he was, you know, attending protests and participating. And often the paintings are seen as very divergent from that. But I think Turquoise, you've beautifully, as, as Phyllis said, sort of returned them perhaps to the urgency of their own time, which is, you know, different. And yet maybe that urgency also exists today, that urgency that we need to find ways to refuse and ways to become you know, agents of our own future. And, and it's, you know, so it's very interesting. Oof. <laughs> I'm looking at the time, should we, should we, uh, yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I, I find, I find the Terrell projections at pace, absolutely astonishing. Um, I'm amazed that the lines are not longer. Uh, when they were showed in winter many years ago, I mean, the wait was longer. Um, the sad part is the cycle lasts 79 minutes, but mostly people are only in there for five to 10 minutes. And um, the I, I, I was able to catch both the end and the beginning of, of the cycle. And that was um, astonishing and has, involves red. And unfortunately in the little sequence we have here, um, we don't have red, but we do have a blue. Um, and there's a way, if you sit in the middle of a long bench, I think you see it head on. I was against a wall because they were letting me stay. And the very last of the images we're gonna see is how you see it from, from the side wall. Um, um, also that blue kind of astonished me because I've been to so many Terrells that to some extent, I am amazed that his palette will, will recur in all these pieces, that, that, that there is a, there's a similarity um, that I was not prepared for. That's what I saw when I was seated on the bench. And now I, I've put in some images to give us a sense of time and space. And also I'm going to mention a sort of sense of time travel. One of the first of the uh, sky spaces all of us ever saw was this initial one at PS1 that has been redone. Uh, the carpet, the seating and the lighting has been redone when the day I went there a couple of years ago, it was a playpen. And uh, because the door had said meeting room, there actually was a guy teaching his class because the class could sit there. And uh, the sky spaces have become much more sophisticated. The other, the other, besides the PS1, which was an initial introduction for many of us, the, the next two images are the corridor at the MFA Houston. Um, uh, Terrell has done a number of corridors and this was another way to get to know his work. And it's kind of interesting, Alex, because um, on the floor, you can't enter. It's the same system that he's using. Uh, with the Reinhardts. Um, I've put in now, um, because I've seen so many sky spaces, um, I don't think many people travel and don't realize how, when they are constructed, when it's not just a cutout in a ceiling, the architecture is critical. This is one in Chicago. Um, that just blew my mind. And you're gonna see how there is a, a certain sci-fi quality. Also, 
um, you can enter these spaces um, before 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 nightfall, before twilight, and 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 have a rewarding experience. Um, now there are three. This is in Claremont College, where uh, Terrell actually received his master's degree. And as some of you might know, there's an extraordinary Sikeros there that Jackson Pollock used to hitch out to see. Um, so this sky space, this was just before twilight and um, you're, you're the next one um, here, you know, uh, God, there's no pointer. Um, um, uh, it, 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 the next time you're in a sky space, remember to sit facing the west, which is what what an owner of a sky space in Los Angeles advised me, um, because the sun sets in the west. Um, and he, it was very cold, and so the next one is different than the than the the babies. Um, it is sweet; they brought their dogs, but it was really cold. Um, the next is my favorite. Um, I love the Yorkshire Sculpture Park. This was um, a duck, um, a deer shelter, and it just gives you an idea of how Terrell can adapt to so many different situations. This is the entrance, but the next one you just see looking down, you know how it's integrated into the landscape. And the next one is, you know, that's the sky space where the trees are. Um, so the next one, again, and I wasn't there um, um, at night, but, but there are these amazing geometric plays with um, um, sunshine. The net, and that was 2007. Can we just race through this? Uh, the, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So this is Rice University, where um, um, again, Terrell uh, created his own sky space. You really think it's going to lift off and go into outer space. The next one show uh, uh, the next one shows the diversity of the entrances this one you can enter straight ahead and you're in the sky space or you could mount the steps and um, there is another viewing uh, station up there if you go back one yeah see at this by this point Terrell has um, um, worked much more on road and crater and the benches are fa fancier, the materials are much greater. Um, can we go back to now the Guggenheim? Perfect. So this is, uh, now I understand that, that just the way we have Ad Reinhardt read, this is James Terrell read. Um, um, I, it's uh, my favorite, um, um, and this is looking up into the dome of the Guggenheim, but experiencing this involved not just the colors, but looking at the geometry differently. Can we have the next? Yeah, this was gray. The gray was astonishing. The next. And there you see how it's it constantly changed. This also is a blue that I now realize is a typical um, uh, Terrell color. You would have you would think they're 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 more expansive, and so this is again looking up into the Guggenheim dome, and there were so many ways to see it. Now we're going to just jump over rice and 
this is a swimming pool in Greenwich that Terrell did in 2008 that is um, the light reflected in the swimming pool and those rectangles on the left are windows and the shades can be lifted and the linear element is how the color travels from the back and it's kind of astonishing um, and I'm just closing with Blum and Poe where Terrell um, shows they have an executive space in the back with um, a sky space and layering color and Terrell even the last image is um, Terrell designed the furniture there so it's it's like it, it, it's astonishing um, how many pots he has his fingers in now I guess for the purposes of our conversation, can we go back to, um, I guess, uh, one of the Guggenheim images? Um, I feel that in, in, the, in, in the conversation that we've been having, with Terrell, you're dealing with time. You're obviously dealing with space. I've shown you so many different spaces and you sit there and it involves your time. Um, I, I wish I could have sat through the, 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 the Pace Gallery 79 minutes. Um, and in some very bizarre way, it's not just the time of our presence, but there's also some very, very bizarre time travel. Dan Flavin in the 70s used to complain that New York critics would write about his work, but they didn't know it because they didn't know it well because they hadn't traveled to Europe and seen his shows. And Terrell really involves traveling. And I would say it's travel with an asterisk, it involves time travel. So that's sort of my presentation here. Great, thank you all so much. Um, what a lovely uh, meditation on these two um, artists. Um, Matthew, have you have have you have you gotten to go to Arizona? I haven't, but I was I was thinking about what you were saying about, you know, the um, the colors, the Terrell colors. You know, in 1969, when he was starting his experiments with what he called tuning spaces, by you know trying to cove corners of rooms, and then put in a certain kind of light, or combine two different kinds of hues of light in different parts of a room, and then even put in a sound. Uh, he was doing a lot of um, experiments in, you know, uh, synesthesia is what he called it. Um, and he was doing some of those experiments with Robert Irwin around the art and technology um, collaboration that they were involved with. But it was what was in, what's interesting to me is to see how now he's very interested in cycling through colors. Whereas before, I think in the beginning, he was very much interested in like a, a kind of a space and a color that felt right together. And, and, and then that evolved into something rather different. And, and I think that the time element that you're talking about is, is exactly what, what's at stake there. Um, I, I, sat in the, I sat in the swimming pool for almost two hours and I later was told that there were the, the, the controls, there were two different sets of uh, color systems, but this red and blue seemed to be consistent. Mm -hmm. Can I add one more thing? I was, yeah. I was reading um, um, uh, in an interview that Terrell gave in 1969 about something he said about um, him being inspired by Sura, um and his pointillist paintings. And he compared Seurat to Cezanne. And he said, you know, the difference for me is that Cezanne gives us an insight into his vision, 
whereas Sura gives us an opportunity to have our own kind of vision. And I think, and what he meant by that is that, you know, the, with the optical mixture, the light kind of combining in your eye that, that you were the one activating that. And it struck me as an interesting connection to Reinhardt. It struck me as an interesting connection to this idea of the platform as well, because of course for Sura always felt that if you, you had to stand at a certain distance from a painting to get the optical mixture. And I think that, you know, Reinhardt very much uh, also by pushing the viewer away from the painting was not just trying to protect the surface of the canvas. And I know this was implied in what Alex was saying. It was not just that, but it was also about establishing that correct distance for doing the kind of things that uh, Torquoise was also talking about, that sense of that involvement in the immersion. And of course, Irwin was, was very much right there with, with, with that. He was very, he also included those kinds of platforms. He wanted people to stand at a certain distance. Um, and of course, there's also a parallel with Irwin lighting his discs in certain ways, the sense of how do you, how do you light, how do you use light as part of the work of art rather than just something that's taken for granted behind it? And so you can see the carrying through of some of those ideas into Terrell and, and that overlap that they had. So it's really, really fascinating kind of uh, um, conversation between two artists, which in my mind includes a third artist who's not, who's not there. Yep. Well, of course, we know because of your um, article for The Rail, Matthew, that uh, also uh, Terrell attended this, um, you know, this, this lecture that Reinhardt gave. And so in a way, obviously, there's that connection. And a lot of LA artists, I think, attended that lecture. It seemed like it was quite infamous. I don't know if it was influential or Right. But, yeah. He gave two lectures in 62. So it was when, when he had that show at Duan, he, he gave the lecture right before the opening. So before the show even opened, he spoke. So they first heard him speak before they got to see the art. Mm -hmm. And I believe that was his first show with Duan. But he gave a second lecture at Chenard Art Institute. So he gave two. Doug Wheeler was at the one at uh, Chenard. And he recalls Reinhardt talking about the space of the studio and all the stipulations about how high it had to be, how long it had to be, how wide it had to be. And he was just thrilled by this. And then of course, at Pasadena Art Museum was all about artist as artist, what kind of an artist you have to be, you know, and, and all this stuff. And so it was all about those delimitations. And then of course, with the studio space idea and that affective quality of space, space as something that is not to be taken for granted, but has, it has an impact on what, um, one is um, uh, what, how one experiences. Uh, that also made me think of Turquoise's work as well and the idea of space and affect and experience. And so it seems like a nice kind of, kind of connection between them. Well, I think that um, I was thinking about this idea of architecture, space and light. And when I think about, I think, thoroughly about what Terrell is doing with um, Reinhardt's work, it, it has me thinking about what kind of overall um, installations do we, um, are we interested in now in the way they work as service? And are these sort of optical, perceptual, um, cognitive experiences a form of service? Right, and can these um, works in this contemporary moment of the now, can artists within their studio practices think about a sort of consciousness experience with painting as a form of service? And um, so, you know, that's both with, I think, architecture and, um, and painting. Can these cognitive experiences be talked about through the lens of, uh, service and you know on top of experience and the experience um, so with with my work I try to figure out how to undo or unkeep um, you know architecture of a, you know extraction possession a sort of architecture and work that comes from the shock of the you know industrialization so I'm trying to figure out how to um, think about um, you know, Erwin and Terrell and 
a Reinhardt and, you know, as could this, could these cognitive experiences be taken into um, a condition of service? And maybe Terrell's experiences, I saw, of course, um, the installation at the Guggenheim several times, and I, I, I think I wanted to think of it as, um, you know, a space of service. And then, of course, the service got me into thinking about the spiritual and, you know, sort of, of course, thinking about Reinhardt, so not me <laughs> right back outside of thinking of these things as um, spiritual. So I think that that's an a interesting tension um, that I, I tried to enter into between um, with my work and its affect on um, people who experience it experience it? What am I asking um, people to go through? I would have asked, what am I asking your eyes and brains and minds and bodies to go through? And if I'm asking them to go through something, can it also be um, the work via conditions of service in any way to, uh, to, to get into a consciousness to experience it? So I'm interested in that tension between uh, the installations and the spatiality of uh, the suggested space. It's not like he demands these spaces, so he suggests them in a way that I think is pretty generous as well. Well, I think that brings up the sort of interesting aspect of, you know, this sort of origin point of uh, Terrell within the Mendota Hotel and this sort of specifics of viewing and so again, you're saying it's, there's, there's sort of elements of the spiritual, but it's sort of removed from any specific iconography. So the idea that you kind of had to like go to that space and then trail kind of had to lead you through this, this sort of sequence, I think it sort of gets to that idea. Like, and it's sort of like at the root, I think of this practice, this idea that, you know, how do you sort of lead the viewer through? And that's, again, we could say this is part of the experience of looking at a, a Reinhardt and it's maybe what links these these works together but I love that idea of thinking of the sort of I don't know the ritual of visitation in this sort of origin moment of Terrell and the idea that Terrell refused a lot of you know he had a lot of interest and in, I think that book that you edited um, uh, Matthew with that early interview and, and Terrell at the time is preparing actually for an exhibition at Pace and this is 1969 and obviously that show doesn't happen so there's this interesting way in which Terrell also decides at this key moment when he could already have been a star, he says, no, I want to work on things a bit more and I want to figure out what I'm going to do. And he doesn't really exhibit until the mid, I think it's that show in at the Stadelik maybe in 76, I think, which is like the first, the sort of debut, so to speak of Terrell. And so you have these years in which it's this very private personal experience of visitation. And I know that's something that I think recurs in those artists uh, those light and space artists is that idea of like going to the studio and the studio being this kind of prime space that's constructed in a very particular way uh, to see the work in the right way. And I think it took time for those artists to think how they could translate the same way that it took Reinhardt a long time to figure out the ideal way that he wanted his paintings to be exhibited and seen. It also took the light and space artists quite a while, many of them, to understand how they could translate what they were doing in their studios to the less controllable spaces of uh, you know, the institution. I mean, Terrell, I guess, does that show um, at the muse at LACMA, right? Is, 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 wasn't he one of the young artists, uh, Matthew, that had the show, like Mary Course also, there was like a series of shows that John- You're talking about the young artist, the, the, the prize, the, the award? Yeah, um, and you have these little shows. I think that's the only show, right, that Terrell does until- Yeah. yeah. You know, you made a really interesting point just there, Alex, um, about this whole question that's oftentimes misunderstood that the white cube of the gallery somehow determined the art that would come to it. It's, it was never that. It was always the other way around. It was the artist studios that got turned into these places that were increasingly refined to show the work in a way that the artists staged and wanted that way. And then they demanded that, this, that the galleries ultimately adapt themselves and otherwise they wouldn't go. Like Pace Gallery famously 
was the one that Irwin chose because they would let, because Arnie Glimcher would let him do whatever he wanted. Whereas the other galleries that were courting him in New York, they, they, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let him transform that gallery that way. Doug Wheeler, same way. And I think maybe that's why Thoreau also had this crisis in 69, where he, he actually does describe in this interview we're talking about specifics about what he's planning to do. Two to three pieces with different light, uh, sort of rooms that I was talking about before where you'd have a synesthetic kind of feel to it. And suddenly he pulls the plug on not just that show, but a major show at the Ace Gallery, not the Ace Gallery, I'm sorry, at uh, the Tate in London, another major traveling show that was going from um, Fort Worth to, um, I think it was a Stedelijk. And so he just suddenly withdraws from that. And I think, again, it has to do with how does the work that you're exploring in your studio translate into, into these spaces of reception? And that's where a lot of that tension lies. Well, and this is a great point, because yes, we think the White Cube emerges as an institutional structure, but I think you're right that it's more the gallery, the uh, artist studio turning in that became the, the first White Cube. I mean, and that's, we sort of forget that what were the galleries like in the 50s and 60s? I mean, they were very like townhouses, small scale, you know, if you look at Castelli Gallery or Sidney Janis, these were, you know, modeled. This was the sort of original moment of the dealer was trying to present the work in a home environment so that you could visualize it on your wall. And that's that idea of painting and a certain thing. And so when you have the emergence of minimalism and a certain kind of work, you, that then, it took time for these things to catch up. And then, so in a sense, you know, yeah, that it's amazing to imagine that, yeah, this aesthetic of this sort of radical art has now become also the sort of instigator of a whole sort of what we might see as a hyper commercial vision of this sort of neutral, large scale container environment. Uh, but it kind of emerges as a sort of a, an idea about a certain way of looking, which is about a sort of like remove all the other, you know, the riffraff, like we don't need windows and curtains and, you know, we need big scale and, you know, white walls. And so, but now Terrell in a way creates a container, right? That's like sort of then the next stage is to create a new form of container within that container. You know, the way that, you know, you have to sort of come into the gallery and wait in line and then be sort of seated in this, you know, environment. Mm -hmm. Um, I also I... appreciated the, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, please, Turquoise, go ahead. I, what I think is also interesting about the, um, the Reinhardt installation is that, that center seated area. And I think that Terrell was successful in sort of creating these zones of experience and with these sort of ways in which, um, you sort of enter the gallery and are surrounded by, um, and, I, and I'm thinking architecturally, surrounded by these sort of instances where each of the paintings has its own um, sort of spaces. And then in the center of the space, you see this round moment. So you have these sort of really hyper rectilinear conditions. And then you have this curvilinear condition um, in the center. And I think that when we're when I'm in my studio in particular and trying to figure out how to think about distance as an optical experience, um, I'm really interested in the way Terrell is really cognizant of distance as a condition of time and space. Because we often talk about time and we often talk about movement, but um, um, I titled a lot of my uh, projects using um, the language around distance because I'm also interested in looking at through from a distance and what kind of um, politic that may bring of closeness and distance and measured and metered and um, the ways in which um, it can also, you know, when, when you're talking about traveling to Terrell, that is a idea of time right, in time travel but it is an idea of distance as well and how is distance worn on the body right outside of time how is distance worn on the mind outside of time how is things like distance worn on 
the visual experiences um, that we have. So I think about distance in relationship to time as well. And I guess we all have to go to, isn't it Patagonia in Argentina that has the James Turrell, I think it may even be called the James Turrell Museum, but the idea that this sort of like uh, center of, you know, where we could see the most Turrell works is in this kind of very particular uh, place. It's sort of a pilgrimage site. Um, so it sort of goes to that idea. Um, amazing. I just, I want to get in some um, audience uh, questions, if that's okay with folks. Um, one um, from Athena Constantine um, actually speaks to what um, you were discussing before about spirituality. Um, so Athena, I don't know if you are here still, if you want to turn on your mic. Um, Athena Constantine, she might have Hi, uh, yeah, I'm still here. Um, it's a simple question. I was wondering if Ad Reinhardt had ever talked about um, spiritual influences or philosophical influences. Sure. So, Ryan, yes. Oh, go ahead. Oh. Um, Torquoise, do you want to jump in, in fact? Oh, that was probably, probably going to say the same thing as this idea of like this Eastern kind of way of thinking and believing. Um, that's, that's okay. okay. Um, yes, um, as you're saying, yes, I think he was very engaged with Eastern spirituality. And in fact, um, you know, he started teaching painting at Brooklyn College, but he also took on, I think it speaks to the times, but he also started teaching, uh, you know, Chinese painting and sort of quote unquote Asian art because there was no one with a specialty, but Reinhardt actually was widely traveled uh, in, in Asia and he collected and researched a lot of material. And Phyllis mentioned briefly his slides and there's a lot of slides that he took. Uh, he was especially interested in Cambodia and Khmer sculpture and in fact wrote an essay about Khmer sculpture. But what's interesting is that Reinhardt was very much a student of a lot of spiritual traditions um, and in fact, I think he really liked especially, and this is also to go to another point, which was that even though he was interested in abstraction in the present, you know, in his present, he was, for him, art history was this long lineage of what he would call art as art. So there was a way in which he was interested in these quote unquote spiritual traditions because for him, they were a sort of pure expression of form. And so I think that's the important part is that Reinhardt, was always trying to, let's say, remove the religious from the spiritual. He was interested in the formal achievements of what we might call religious art, but he was not himself a practicing, you know, religious man. And he was not, I think, interested in spirituality as a sort of mystification. He was very critical, for example, of Mark Rothko when Rothko did the Rothko Chapel. He thought this, this was a terrible idea and that art should not be in the service of any particular uh, religious ends, even if obviously in the Rothko case, it also has a sort of uh, disconnection from any specific belief system, despite being you know, in a chapel context. So I think there's a complicated relationship where Reinhardt was very much a, almost a scholar, you could say, of certain religious texts and his library was full of these books, but he was not sort of after, I think, a spirituality in, in that sort of mystical sense. I think he was a very sort of pragmatic artist who was interested in sort of perceptual effects. But at the same time, he was open enough to understand that the, in a way the history of art that he was interested in actually really went through a lot of these sort of spiritual and mystical traditions uh, at the same time. Can I add one thing, Alex, to what you've just said? Um, also, I think it was the persona of what he called an the Oriental, that was the, that was the language he used, uh, artist as a kind of sage scholar and hermit and uh, this kind of image of a, of a, an aloof um, artist who is fully concentrated on what they're doing. I think that persona also was as much a, of what was of interest as, as the other things as well, as a kind of model. 
Absolutely. And if I may plug the Ad Reinhardt issue of the Book and Rail, which is, of course, all available free online, there are several essays where people uh, engage with that tradition, including, uh, for example, that his best friend uh, in, from college was the famous monk uh, Thomas Merton, who was also, of course, a poet and taught him actually calligraphy and so on. And so he had an amazing, very close relationship with certain people um, who were, in fact, very spiritually engaged. Yeah, I think that tension between Reinhardt around the idea of the chapel is really interesting. And when I read Reinhardt's work, I mean, his own writing, you can feel, of course, um, his deep intentions <laughs> around every step. And as a, when I bring up this idea of I want to bring it up just one more time, just because I'm thinking about it. This idea of service in relationship to spirituality. Can the work, and I understand his intention, but can that work um, operate in a way that offers um, an individual to come in, uh, offers a level of stillness, offers, offers a lot of level of optical experience, is that is that a service, right? Is it a kind of condition where it expels um, in that moment the idea of spirituality, I'm sorry, uh, religiosity and all of that kind of violence that may come with that and put in place um, an opportunity for one to be in and be as um, this idea of the here and now. So I'm interested in that tension between um, Reinhardt and Rothko, <laughs> of course I am, but I'm really interested in that. And is the chapel, is that chapel a space um, in an architecture of service? And is Terrell's work right now in place in a condition of service? I mean, I'm, it's a question, you know, how can, does, does it operate like that? Or can it operate like that? Or maybe it just does operate like that for me and I accept it as so. Phyllis, maybe, maybe this is an opportunity to say something about the, you know, Quaker, Quaker background of Terrell and the role that that plays in, in some of his interest in light, or at least what's been said about that. I don't know if that's something that's, that's, um, that's something that you're interested to talk about. No, I've been to the two Quaker meeting houses. Um, I found the one in Houston absolutely astonishing. I was there actually with a group of artists. Um, because we were there when the MFA had a show of um, Prince. Oh my God, this is terrible. I'm forgetting who's Prince, uh, who, who published the Prince, which is embarrassing. Um, and Alex Katz totally hated that meeting house, which I have, I have never understood. Um, I... I love being in, I think, I think, I think you're not just looking at, at, at Terrell, you're being enveloped by it. And I love, I loved the meeting house in Houston. It went from Tiepolo to Robert Ryman. It went from clouds to just a blank sky. Um, and this, this, it was the same thing at the Guggenheim. Um, I was very lucky. I, 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 I had been invited and had intent, attended a memorial for Thomas Messer. And for some bizarre reason, I ended up being in, 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 in the Guggenheim space all by myself. And you just you're sucked into it and to me this is just art this is what you want to experience in art that you are just totally engaged I think this is what Torquasi was saying um and 
Um, I love the idea of Terrell. Um, I, I was reading something online today that he had been a lapsed Quaker. I, I don't know if that's like being a lapsed Catholic, but he, he returned to the fold. And I love, I love this engagement. Um, um, I don't know if that's answering your question, but I love being just totally wrapped in, in those colors. Um, Alex, Alex said it was surprising that I'm so passionate about, about, um, about Terrell, but to me, you, I'm not an artist and this is my experience of color. Well, I think to contextualize what I was saying, I, it seems that often there's this divide it, for people that, you know, because of course you emerged uh, writing, doing these amazing interviews with the minimalists, writing the first dissertation on minimalism really as it was unfolding in the late 60s and early 70s. And so it seemed to me that a lot of, um, you know, people that are associated with, let's say, East Coast minimalism really look down on West Coast minimalism or light and space or whatever we want to call it, people like Terrell because they see it as too maybe engaged with spirituality, engaged with a sort of coloristics. I mean, again, these are sort of, this is a, an old sort of uh, discrepancy, this idea that East Coast is hardcore, industrial, rigorous, you know, formal and, you know, even political. And then the West Coast is sort of decorative about the sky, about easygoing California life. And, and I think I think that was what I was sort of saying, like, it's nice that you have this amazing grounding in minimalism, but also see the sort of interest, uh, you know, of, of Terrell. Well, and how about the show that Helen Pashigian just had? I mean, that was to die. Um, thank God we're seeing so much more of this stuff now. Um, I'm going to pop in uh, to get to another audience question um, to our friend GE. Do you want to go ahead and turn on your mic and ask? Thank you so very much. Um, in thinking about the use of sfumato as a way to present Reinhardt's paintings uh, in this way, isn't this kind of a guide for us to embrace ambiguity and paradox and uncertainty and to dispense with preferred knowledges and predictabilities and clarities to then enter into a kind of wonderful gray areas and be activated by questions and mystery? Um, I'm going to answer it first because you kept putting this sfumato word down there. That's like what I what I identify with the brush strokes of Rembrandt. I, I don't think Sfumato is here. This is just about totally embracing the color, totally embracing the experience, or that's, or that's how I experience it. Um, uh, I, I, had, I, had, I had said this to somebody um, uh, last week. I didn't know whether I was gonna talk about it. I had these rare um, cataracts before I was 40 years old. It was just, I was one of the, it was a fluke. And um, it took a, two years between my right eye and my left eye um, being operated on. And in that period, um, I discovered that my right eye and my left eye did not see the same colors. And that was kind of astonishing. But what I also discovered was during that period, I could really see the squares in an Ad Reinhardt. <laughs> and I don't think that has to do with sfumato. That's just about giving into the experience, which is going back to Terrell seeing the light. I think related to, if I may just quickly, related to that, something very interesting is that what we've noticed, because I worked a lot with that Reinhardt Foundation, saw a lot of paintings, and 
was involved with things like the Zwerner show and documentation. And what we found is that digital photography allows for us to see those colors, like they almost come out more in the photograph than in real life. And so there's this interesting paradox where for many years, Reinhardt's were being reproduced as these black squares. And then over time, in fact, technology has almost gone in the line of the, um, you know, the paintings themselves, like almost more so than they even exist, like to bring up more color. And so, yes, there's this sort of way in which I don't know if there's a sort of veiling as much as a sort of embedding of different stages. But anyway, do we have more questions? Thank you very much. Can I add one thing? Because I do think the question of ambiguity is pertinent. I think that Absolutely. certainly Terrell very much wanted to explore uh, kind of boundaries of experience, however he defined that. And I think that was about reaching a stage of what would be ambiguous and, 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 and not have clear contours. I mean, why he coved the corners of his rooms and so forth. And that, that might then have a, a sort of um, a kind of natural relationship to uh, certain certain other ways of um, thinking, you know, thinking differently, thinking thinking in ways that you know at the time certainly they talked about as a a kind of a reshaping the shape of one's consciousness. That was a that was a major priority in the late '60s when Terrell was coming up with these ideas. And again, I I throw Irwin in there because he was in dialogue with him at the time and spoke quite a bit more about this than Terrell did, who tended to be more reticent. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Um, we just have a final question um, that came in from Michael Krasowitz. Um, if you're here and you want to um, unmute and ask your question. Hello, how are you doing? Excellent conversation. Um, I, uh, my question is, I. I was thinking about the work and it seems to me like the natural extension, like one artist was inspiring the next, was for this to work in a virtual space. And uh, what I'm wondering is, would a virtual space work for this kind of work or does it, may, does it necessitate that there's a physical presence to, a, to uh, experience the work? Do you think these guys would be against the idea of that putting on a helmet and having the same kind of experience? Well, quickly, I would say Terrell has maybe engaged with this where he's created these little pods that you can enter. I've not actually encountered one of these. Maybe Phyllis has in her many journeys through the world of Terrell. But um, so I think Terrell maybe would be the most open to this idea because he has created these sort of single person. I mean, they're not virtual in the sense that I don't think they are well, but at the same time, I think he does use digital technology now to manage the systems, but obviously that's not the same as, let's say, a screen space. Um, that said, I think that the role of the physical body is very important. And so I think even with Terrell, even as I think he's very interested in technology, though he also told me he technology was always very simple for him that you know, even in those early pieces, it was, you know, to understand the amount of wattage and then what you would sort of screen off to create the effect. It was never about having a complicated system. Nonetheless, I think he has sort of flirted with some of some more up-to-date systems, whereas I think certain other artists or Reinhardt, of course, Reinhardt dies in 1967, so he has no sort of knowledge of what was to come. And so we can't know what he would have done or thought, but nonetheless, I think that importance of the physical body, and that's something that I, you know, I, I know a lot of people are trying to engage with, and I don't necessarily know enough about the state of digital art to say, but my sense is that these artists would want to somehow have the physical body present in a way that I don't know about how the screen might uh, sort of be able to facilitate that. Wonderful. Um, thank you all. Thank you for those questions. Um, it's been such an engaging conversation. Um, at the rail, we do have a tradition of ending um, our events with some poetry. Um, so uh, I'm happy to introduce um, Mark Wallace, our um, poet of the day. Um, Mark lives in San Diego, where since 2005, he has been working on a multi-part long poem exploring the psychogeography of Southern California, the end of America. 
He is the author of many other books of poetry, most recently notes from the Center on Public Policy and several works of fiction, including the novels Crab and The Quarry and the Lot. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, can everybody hear me out there? Good. Um, uh, so I really appreciate it uh, being uh, part of this discussion. I've been a fan of these artists for a long time, and I'm glad to be uh, reading some poems at the end of this session. Thanks to all of you who are uh, making this happen and to the Brooklyn Rail for, for uh, putting up these uh, great issues and sponsoring uh, these events. Um, I'm gonna read just a couple of uh, uh, poems from the end of America, which uh, uh, Carolyn was just mentioning recently. I've been a, it's a, a work that appears in, in a number of little short books, uh, uh, some of which have been published. A lot of them have been in various literary magazines. They take on different literary structures, a variety of things of that kind, um, uh, but they're all sort of dealing with, with the uh, geopolitical world of the environment of, of San Diego uh, and the, uh, California and Pacific Rim culture uh, um, were largely. Um, I sometimes uh, uh, write topical poems, you know, poems about specific events that are happening, but I'm also, it also takes me a while to uh, 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 finish something. So sometimes my topics are past by the time the poems themselves are ready. Um, but I thought I would start by uh, uh, reading just a two part uh, piece uh, from one section of the end of America. And these are both about, uh, 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 significant flooding that we had here in San Diego in, in uh, uh, the winter of uh, uh, 2018. So this is uh, uh, some poems from the uh, End of America book 20. Rain in patches and ebbs turns heavy like a waterfall and the mud slides down from hills and yards. Water pools deep over the pavement and underpasses. Mud crawls along the surface, indifferent to property markers, border fences, metal girders on half-built high rises. People with no homes are herded towards buses by men in heavy orange coats. People with homes stay in them or drive towards them through puddles growing into pools. The concept of a bright sun city hunkers down or floats away, assert emergency, initiate contact. From my car, then from my apartment, I tune to the information channels, which tell people where not to go. The stable streets of the city slip into the dirt, mass and movement, person and perception, altered sliding. Here's the second part of this piece. Christmas music is piping through the downtown air days after the flooding. Many half block streets recently re-oiled. People sleeping under the awnings of buildings. Mud ruined sleeping bags tossed on corners beside bunches of rental scooters. Apartment residents come out of doors with dogs on leashes, walk past corners and windows, fences, scaffolds, boarded up buildings, which are flood repair, which new construction. There's no way to tell. Dirt and building aren't opposites, reflect each other in different conditions. Flood leads to commerce. Commerce creates new Pathways for flooding, motion tuned for profit, treats itself as the foreground of its own rubbish, tosses people like rubbish or puts them to work. Pillows and backpacks on sidewalks, hard hats on heads. Come use me, the Christmas music pipes. Surround yourselves with the things I make and you will know yourselves in me. Vast playground of dirt and in it, fortress of dollars, perpetual spinning. Rows of light shows tease the mind to let us know which part of ourselves to value, which parts to throw away. 
Um, and then I will conclude with just uh, uh, one other piece uh, from a different section of the end of America, uh, but actually uh, another poem that turns out to have uh, uh, rain in it too. <clears throat> And this is one of the poems that appears in the Brooklyn Rail issue this month. Of this month, uh, thanks to Anselm Berrigan for, for putting it there, and to all the rest of you for the, who do the hard work on the issue. <clears throat> if real news is the fact of rich people plundering the poor, even in dreams, then this street of puddled water splashing up at the feet of people with nowhere indoors to go is the basis on which the vacation city builds its fantasies of ease. Awareness that politics preserves the constant saying that not much reveals more than struggle does, helps me walk along while laughing faces pass, raincoats, knit sweaters, tilted hats, shoulders drawn up in wind. Nothing less than experience as it presents itself calls for acknowledgement, one unisolated instant, then another. There's no way to avoid giving back the particles of a body to the air. Hoarding doesn't prevent loss. That sucking sound, the breath that cannot draw itself, is all the grasping to control the streets, the buildings, the trees, the sky happening at once, which has never saved even one person from death. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, that was beautiful, thank you. Um, and thank you to Torquase, Matthew, Alex, and Phyllis um, for such an amazing conversation. Um, and we also just want to thank Adriana, Emily, and Hannah, um, and the team at PACE um, for making today's conversation possible. Um, we encourage everybody to check um, our uh, website shortly. We'll have the conversations uploaded um, on our YouTube channel. And um, please join us Monday um, at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Mungo Thompson and Andrew Woolbright on the event of um, Time Life, uh, Mungo Thompson's show on view at Karma Gallery through April um, 16th. Um, and we'll be concluding that event with a reading by Joshua um, Nehigan. Um, so please uh, turn your microphones on. You can say goodbye um, as you leave. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Phyllis. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks, Phyllis. Phyllis. Thanks, Thank you, Mark. Awesome. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you so much. So much. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Phyllis. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mom, you're there. Thank you, Alex. I'm here. I'm I'm driving. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you, Alex. <laughs> driving safely. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> this was fascinating. Yeah, very nice. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much for love the poem too, Kit. Everything. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. That was wonderful. Thank you. I appreciate it. I really enjoyed the conversation between all of you. Uh, uh, I've been to that chapel, the Roscoe Chapel there in Houston, and I've been a fan of Ad Ron Hart's work for years. I discovered the comics just by accident somewhere years and years ago. I can't even remember where that was. Got very taken up with those. So. Well, you have to go back to the Roscoe Chapel because <laughs> it was the pandemic, um, uh, and they reopened it months into the pandemic. They've redone the skylights. And it's a whole new experience. Wow, fascinating. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank I, would, you. I would end, but I think Fong joined just to say say hi here. Hi. Thank you. Oh, wow. thank you for You're really in a car. <laughs> yes. Thanks, Phyllis. I'm dying to re-listen to it. I just have lunch. I saw Arnie and Sean Scully and everybody. Show the show also, so I'm thrilled. I can't wait to rewatch the whole thing. So thank, thanks, Phyllis. Well, uh, Fong, I'll pace gallery so that you can stay in the space longer. Yeah, I spent uh, 40 minutes there. 
It was oh, great. Okay. You know, okay. It was great. It was fantastic. I'm I'm dying to hear the rest of what James and to Kwasi. The Kwasi is brilliant. And oh I'm my like, God, unbelievable. Agreed. I love the Kwasi. Hmm. Hmm. Kwasi had to go. Yeah, and love, love <laughs> all of you. Come on, it's just amazing. So thank you. Oh my God, your car is even moving. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm multitasking. It's insane, Phyllis. But we yeah, are thrilled to do. Yeah, I can't wait to share you the good news too. I'm gonna call each of you guys and share it in a, this weekend, okay? Right. Yeah. Have a good yeah. Thing I'm having me. yeah. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Phyllis. Thanks everybody at the rail. Good. You guys are really great. Yeah. We love you. Thank we you. Love you. Love you. Thank you. We love, love and adore everyone. you. Okay, take care, everyone. Yes. Have a good weekend. Good. Thanks, Alex, you guys. Again. Oh, yeah. Happy Friday. Happy Thank Friday, everybody. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, James. Ciao. Thank you for the beautiful reading. Grazie mille. Ciao.